welcome to the fifth and final week of our series titled Remember. And uh, if you've been tracking along with us for the last four weeks, our, our primary intent, our whole aim with this, this entire series really has been to encourage you all. It's been to encourage our own hearts. Uh, and really the intent was we, are, we were just hopeful that each week as you came in here and we gathered together, you'd leave more encouraged than when you showed up. And so hopefully that's been your experience over the course of these last four weeks. And the way that we've done that is by way of an, what we've called our anchor text. It's Psalm 103. And Psalm 103 is a, a prayer that's thousands of years old. It was written a few thousand years ago by a man named David. And the whole intent behind that psalm was really to drive the promises of God deep into the recesses of our hearts. Um, and so that's what we've been trying to do. That's this act of remembrance that we've been trying to do as a church family over the last four weeks, and we're going to do it again today for one last time. Uh, so before we do that, though, and this has been, I think this has been pretty neat uh, from my vantage point, us as a church family reading Psalm 103 verses 1 through 5 every week. Uh, hopefully you've remembered that by now, and if you haven't, that's okay too. But we're going to read it one more time before we dive in. So let's go ahead and turn, uh, if you've got your Bible with you, turn to Psalm 103, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and here's what it says. My soul praise Yahweh and all that is within me praise his holy name. My soul praise the Lord and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Now today we're going to look at the, uh, the, the final promise that, that's, in the, that's found in this psalm. It's, it's in verse 5. It's, he satisfies you with goodness. And um, from my vantage point, when you read a verse like this, and, and really I think when you, when you read anything that's included in the canon of Scripture, um, always you're going to find something that's revealed about God and something that's revealed about us. And so what I think this verse shows us about us is that the human soul uh, has like this infinite thirst that nothing in this world can sufficiently satisfy. I think we have limitless desires, a limitless thirst, and, and the real dilemma that we have is that we have limits. The people around us have limits. The things that we turn to to satisfy our desires have limits. Uh, the best career, the best marriage, the best, you name it, really isn't enough to satisfy this deep thirst that's embedded in the human soul. And so what I think that really means is that our quality of life really doesn't depend on having enough or being enough or having the right position in society or having the right resources or being in the right relationship. I think the quality of our life, what this verse shows us, is that it hinges entirely on the source of our satisfaction. And um, we have this infinite thirst that really serves as evidence that we need an infinite God. Um, and, and, and furthermore, he's the only one capable of quenching the infinite thirst of the human soul. And what's really, really powerful about a verse like that's found in Psalm 103, verse 5, is that it doesn't just tell us that God's capable of doing that. It actually shows us that he's promised to do that. And so um, I couldn't think of a better story to help us understand this promise that God's made to people like us with this insatiable thirst in our souls, this promise that he's willing to, capable of, and will satisfy that with his goodness. Uh, I couldn't think of a story better than the, the, the soul-shaping, what I'm calling the soul-shaping conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman. Um, it's a conversation that unfolded around 30 AD, and in uh, real simplistically stated, Jesus ends up chatting with, with a Samaritan woman. It's a hot day. They chat over a cold drink. And what he does is he ends up drawing her out in a way that no one else was capable of. And um, what she does in response to that, it's the same thing we do when someone's trying to draw us out. She deflects. She distracts. She does all the things we do when we're coming to grips with what's really going on deep inside of our hearts. But then, uh, because of Jesus' gentleness and patience, she actually starts to see how all the disappointment and all the dissatisfaction in her own life really is just evidence that we were made for something more than this life could offer. Um, so the transcript of this conversation is recorded in John's gospel account. It's in chapter 4. I'm going to share verses 5 through 29 with you, and then 
I w- I'd like to use that. My intent is to use that to show you two things. The first thing I want to show you is the type of satisfaction that Jesus offers. And then the second is I just want to show you how to experience it or how to get access to it. Um, so turn with me to John. I'm in chapter 4. I'm going to pick up in verse 5, and we'll, I'm going to read all the way to verse 29. And here's what it says. Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about six in the evening. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, for his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God, And who is saying to you, give me a drink? You would ask him, and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman said, you don't even have a bucket, and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again Ever. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said I don't have a husband, Jesus said, for you've had five husbands and the man, you're now, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you were a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, yet you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is, is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. I am he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. And just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the men, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? That's, that's, God's, that's God's word. Amen. So when Jesus sits down at uh, Jacob's well and he asks this Samaritan woman for a, j- a drink, what we see real quickly, it's actually in verse 9, is she's, she's caught off guard. And in uh, I, I think she has some justifiable reasons for her level of surprise. As a Samaritan woman, she grew up in a culture that led her to believe that she was inferior simply based on her race and her gender. Um, she, also, she was a part of a religious tradition that was seen as heretical and dangerous to the degree that uh, the Jews, a, a group of Jewish people, actually destroyed the Samaritan temple. And so growing up, as you can imagine, in an environment like this can be damaging. It it can wound you in ways that kind of make it impossible to trust people, especially Jewish men. And Jesus, simply stated, is a Jewish man. And so that's part of the reason why she's so shocked. He's a Jewish man is asking her for a drink of water. But then on top of this, and I think this becomes clear when Jesus' disciples show up, Um, That's in verse 28. And they're shocked to see Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman. You see, um, during that time, women had such a low status in ancient Roman, Greek, Jewish, and Samaritan cultures that that a Jewish man talking to a Samaritan woman was, was simply shunned. It was something that was looked down upon. It was frowned upon. It was something that was culturally unacceptable. So that's another dynamic that causes the surprise. But then another variable that, that contributed to her surprise is when she left to go to the well that day, she just didn't expect anyone else to be there. She had planned her trip around a time of day when she knew that no one 
else would be there. You see, drawing water from, from, from a well like this was something that, that women did all the time, and it involved a pretty, the laborious task of toting really large uh, vessels in which you would collect water for all your daily chores, like washing clothes, doing dishes, cooking, cleaning, anything that involved water. And so the best time to do a job like that was one that kept you out of the heat of the sun. Right? And, and, uh, but, but it wasn't just a laborious task. The other dynamic of collecting water from a place like Jacob's Well is it provided a means by which women in the community could have a bit of social interaction, social connection. And so um, this woman, this Samaritan woman knows all this. She knows about all these dynamics. What she also is well aware of is she's made a mess of her life. And so she's timed this trip really to avoid She's not trying to avoid the heat of the day. What she's really trying to avoid is the heat of the cultural backlash that comes when you're not living up to whatever the cultural standard is. She's failed to live up to the moral code, and she really just doesn't want to hear about it. And so she's planned her trip to the well to avoid all of that. She's purposely trying to to avoid being confronted. And so when Jesus sits down and asks this Samaritan woman for a drink, she's surprised. But what's really particularly surprising from my vantage point is what Jesus is actually doing. Because what I see him doing is he's putting his reputation on the line. What Jesus is doing here is he's, he's reaching out to this Samaritan woman, and he's reaching across every single barrier that race, that gender, that morality, that religion, that society, that culture, and that her own shame had put between them. Jesus is treating her in this instance even if it doesn't look as such, with more dignity and respect than anyone ever had, and he's doing it all at the risk of his own reputation. And so when you're not used to be treated, to being treated in a certain way, it can be startling. She's shocked. She's being treated in a way that she's never been treated before. And um, just as a little side note, I think people, people see Jesus operating outside of the traditional boundaries on gender like he is right here, and they say things like, whoa, Jesus was, you know, he was woke, or he was ahead of his time culturally, or um, with regards to views on gender, and, and I think I could understand why someone would say that. However, I just want to offer anyone who's, who's leaning in today, <laughs> I don't think um, that, that time has ever actually caught up with Jesus, that's where I'm at. Um, and so when this Samaritan woman made her way, way to the well that day, I think it's worth pointing out, this was just an ordinary day. She wasn't looking for something. She wasn't trying to figure out how to change the trajectory of her, of her life. She wasn't trying to figure out how to break off this, uh, yet again, another dysfunctional relationship that she'd caught herself in. She wasn't trying to heal emotionally. She wasn't trying to, 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 to heal from her past. All she was trying to do was get some water that would allow her to do the work that she needed to do without being uh, the the brunt of ridicule and being treated like a social outcast or a moral outcast or a religious outcast like she had been countless times before. What she had no idea is that this ordinary trip to Jacob's well was actually going to revolutionize her life. And it wasn't because it was there that day that she found a new technique on how to deal with her brokenness. Um, it wasn't because, you know, she was able to conjure up the inner strength to finally deal with the issues that she had. Um, her life literally changed because she met Jesus. And he offered her something that no one else had ever offered her. And, and what I'm so curious about is she wasn't even asking for it. She wasn't asking for what Jesus offers her, yet he offers it. And here's what he offered her. Here's what I see Jesus offering her. Jesus offers ultimate satisfaction. That's what he's offering this woman at the well. And that's, frankly, that's what he's offering anybody who's willing to receive it. Turn to verse 10. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. So, so I think it's, it's, it's r- relatively clear by the way that Jesus phrases this statement to the Samaritan woman, that the Samaritan woman is at a point in her life where she just can't see what Jesus sees. Now, Jesus is peering into the depths of this woman's soul, and what he sees is someone who is spiritually thirsty. And he sees how desperate she is for love and for approval, for acceptance, for peace of mind, for purpose. He sees how she's desperate for all the things that I think we're desperate for uh, uh, as human beings. He knows how desperate she is 
for ultimate satisfaction. And that's exactly what living water can provide. But what's so amazing from my vantage point about the living water that Jesus offers is it's not something that you have to earn. It's not a reward. It's not a wage. It's not something you acquire or accumulate. And I think this is an extremely important distinction to make because if if the living water that Jesus offers that's, that's so revolutionary in our lives, if it was something that you earned, here's how it would work. Some people would earn it and some people wouldn't. I think when, you, when, when you, you could survey any crowd, and there are some people who are more moral, they're more disciplined, they're more put together, they come from a better, a better pedigree, a better background, they come from, maybe they, they were reared in a household where the relational dynamics were actually healthy. Some people were born into a financial security. Some people have and some people have not. And so if what Jesus was offering is something that we had to earn, some people would be operating at an advantage and others would be operating at a disadvantage. Some would earn it and some wouldn't. But the ultimate satisfaction that Jesus offers, this living water that he's talking about, that he's offering this woman, it's a gift that Jesus is offering to anyone Who's willing to receive it? Now, when it comes to a wage or when it comes to something that you earn, it's real simple. You don't earn things that you don't earn. If you don't go to work, you don't earn the wage. But when it comes to a gift, the only way to to, to not to not um, receive a gift is to not receive the gift. And the way that you would do that is you would fail to, to have the humility that would allow you to see that it's a gift that you actually need. And so Jesus, what he's trying to so politely and patiently and kindly do is help her come to grips with the infinite thirst that's in her soul that no matter what she tries or who she runs to, she just can't seem to satisfy. But she doesn't see it that way. I'll tell you what she does see. (laughs) This is just funny to me. and I don't know if it'll be funny to you. What she does see is that Jesus is tired. He, He doesn't have a bucket, and he's talking about drawing water from a well. And so basically, he's tired, he's thirsty, and he's empty-handed. He's so unassuming in this scenario. So here's what she says. She says, you don't even have a bucket. And then she says, the well's really deep. So where do you even get this living water? Like, this isn't, this isn't her receiving at this point in time. She's actually kind of throwing some shade Jesus' way. And then she chases all that with, you aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well. And drank from it himself, as did his sons in the livestock. What she's saying here is, hey, like, you don't even know how to get water from a well. And you're talking about giving me water that's going to revolutionize my life. She's pushing all the way back on the notion that she needs anything that Jesus would offer her. Um, But here's what I think is so amazing about Jesus. This is what's so appealing to me about Jesus. He doesn't penalize her one bit for doing this. He doesn't clap back. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't cancel her. She's deflecting. She's distracting. She's getting all out indifferent towards Jesus. She's doing all the things that we do when someone starts pointing out the areas of our lives that need to change. And Jesus allows this because he's trying to help her discover that she's spiritually thirsty and that the more she drinks from the wells that can't satisfy, the thirstier she becomes. What he's trying to really help her discover is that she's not just spiritually thirsty. She's actually dying of spiritual dehydration. That's what Jesus is trying to help her see. And like us, at least like me, I'm not going to throw you in this, um, she, d- she just doesn't have the self-awareness to see into her soul the way that Jesus can. And maybe it's because it's hard to come to grips with your own brokenness or, it's, or she's never experienced a relationship where she's actually been able to be completely vulnerable. Or maybe, maybe it's because every time she's put herself out there, she's only ended up wounded, hurt, or alone. But Jesus, what he's doing is he's gently leading her to a place where she can get completely vulnerable and come to grips with the deep thirst that's in her soul that she's been tra- trying to satisfy in some really unhealthy ways. Listen to what he says in verse 13. He says, Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again, ever. And what I think Jesus is politely pointing out is that um, the wells we drink from, the things and the people we look to for our sense of satisfaction, significance, purpose, peace of mind, hope, love, 
they really have the power to shape our lives. And what Jesus is trying to show the Samaritan woman is that if you put the bucket of your soul into any purpose more than Jesus' purpose, into any relationship more than your relationship with Jesus, into any hope more than the hope that you have in Jesus, into any peace more than the peace that Jesus can provide. You might experience degrees of satisfaction over the course of your life, but eventually you're going to die from spiritual thirst. You'll never see the growth that you want to see in your life. You'll never have the patience that you want to have. You'll never have the spiritual depth that you're really after. You'll never be as generous as you know you want to be. And, and frankly, you'll never really enjoy anything because what you're going to spend your time doing is like, like heaping expectations on people and things that they really can't ever live up to. And so you'll go through life dissatisfied and, 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 and you'll never enjoy any of the things that God has put in your life simply for your enjoyment. So that's what he's getting at. And then he takes it one step further. And I think what he says here is a little bit more audacious than anything he said to this point. Here's what he says. Uh, this is in verse 14. He says, In fact, the water I will give you will become a well of water springing up within you for eternal life. So, so to understand this, the magnitude of what Jesus is promising here, I think you have to understand the nature of a spring. Um, I had the privilege of living in, in Guatemala for, for uh, a number of years, and the way that we sourced our water was from a spring. And the spring head was at least an hour's drive up a mountain. Now, we were, we were positioned in a valley between uh, pretty big, pretty massive, amazing, beautiful mountains. We're, we're down in this little valley, and we'd get this slow trickle from this spring, and that's how we got water to, to do all kinds of things. Um, and so that, was, that to me was amazing. Like it was amazing that we had spring water, right? All the stuff we're trying to buy in bottles right now, we had access to it. But one of the most powerful aspects of that spring wasn't the fact that we had water from it. It was the fact that it had somehow made its way up through this massive mountain range that was constructed of all this dense rock and all these layers and, and all this stuff. The point I'm getting at is this spring had somehow worked its way through this mountain up through this mountain, and now we as people had access to it. And I think what, what Jesus is trying to point out here is that the wellspring that he's trying to plant deep in your soul is literally capable of making it from wherever it is to wherever it needs to get. That's how a spring works, through all the rock, through all the debris, through whatever's been piled on top of your life. What Jesus is saying here is he can give you a purpose that will actually unlock your life in ways that you didn't even realize were possible. He can give you the kind of love that's always accessible, and it's not just accessible, it can actually revolutionize your life and change you from the inside out. He's capable of giving you an acceptance and a peace and a sense of beauty that no matter what you face in this world or what pain you endure or what gets piled on top of your life, his joy and his goodness will break through the same way that that spring breaks through that massive mountain. Look, Jesus is promising a lasting permanent satisfaction that wells up within you no matter how bad things break down around you. And, and what he's really talking about when he says eternal life, at least I think, is uh, he's talking about a quality of life. And I would imagine that when you think of eternal life, you probably imagine a life that goes on forever. So I think it is that. It's no less than that, but I think it's so much more than that. Recently, I was um, hanging out with a group of, of, of friends, and, and one of the people in that group brought up the, we were talking about technology, and he brought up the idea of, hey, uh, you know, there's going to be technology in the next couple of decades that will allow people to extend their lives. What do you think about that? And um, here's what I think about that. I think that if, 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 if this life is all that we have, that makes a lot of sense. That's what I want, if this life is all that we have. But I can, I'm, I'm just going to level with you. I'm not looking for uh, a way to make this life last longer or endure longer. All the loss, all the grief, all the pain, all the anguish. I'm not looking for a technology that will extend this life longer. I'm looking, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a quality of life that will absolutely obliterate my pride 
that'll obliterate my anger issues, that'll ob- obliterate my insensitivity towards people that are different than me, that'll obliterate and destroy the insecurity in me. That's the kind of quality of life that I'm looking for. I want a quality of life that frees me from the power of loss, grief, and death. Uh, so, so here's where I'm at. Eternal life is only appealing if it's an eternal life free from everything this life is currently throwing at us. Look, and so what Jesus is getting at is he's saying eternal life is something that he plants deep inside the recesses of your heart that nothing can put out. And it can break through your depression and give you peace. It can break through your guilt and give you freedom. It can break through your pride and produce a deep humility. And when you're confused, it can break through your confusion and give you the kind of clarity that we're all looking for. See, what, what I believe our souls crave more than, any, more than a life that goes on forever is a quality of life that makes us whole. And the reason why we're so spiritually thirsty is because what we're really after is eternal life. And the dilemma we face is that every single day we wake up with the taste of mortality and brokenness in our mouths. And we're trying to quench that deep thirst with things that just leave us more thirsty. And what Jesus is pointing out, I think this is, this is what he's pointing out, is that until you discover what you were really made for and who you were really made for, your quality of life is going to be far less than what it could be. The eternal life that Jesus is talking about is a quality of life that we're looking for. And the only way to start experiencing it is by making Jesus the center of your life. The kind of satisfaction that Jesus offers is ultimate satisfaction. But here's how how you get it. I think to get the satisfaction that Jesus is offering this woman at the well and that he's offering us thousands of years later is you have to transfer your spiritual thirst to Jesus to experience the satisfaction he offers. Look In verse 15, um, the, the Samaritan woman says something that I think it just makes it clear that she really hasn't come, quite come to grips with her own spiritual thirst. And, and here's what she says. She says, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Look, she, she's looking at Jesus' offer of living water as, as something that's just going to make her life easier. It's going to eliminate the need to plan these trips uh, at times of day when no one else is going to be at the well so she can avoid the cultural backlash that she knows people are going to dump on her because of her lifestyle choices. Uh, and, and that's where she's at. And maybe that's where some of us are at, where we're, really, we're hoping that Jesus will just do something that eliminates the tension in our lives or changes our circumstances or gives us who we really need or gives us the job that we really want or the career that we really have been dreaming about. She really just wants to eliminate the tension in her life. But what she doesn't realize yet is that her primary problem isn't physical. It's not physical thirst. Her primary problem is spiritual thirst. And so Jesus, Jesus says something next that I think is really, it's just a really curious statement. It almost sounds like he's changing the subject, but that's not actually what he's doing. He's not changing the subject at all. It's in verse 16. Here's what he says. He says, go call your husband, he told her, and come back here. So Jesus is not, this isn't a subject change. Jesus is getting extremely personal at this point in time. And what he's getting ready to do is draw her out so that she actually can see the deep thirst in her soul. And and some people look at this transition and, and they suggest that Jesus is about to address her sin, that he's about to, you know, put her sin on the table and help her see it. But that's not the tone here. The tone of this verse is not, her sin. He doesn't say, he actually doesn't even say anything about her sin. And he's, he's not condemning her. What he's doing is he's trying to just, he's just trying to help her discover something that she can't see. Jesus says, and, here, and here's what he says. He says, you're right. You don't have a husband, but men have been running your life for a really long time. And not just a couple of men, but men in general. And all those relationships, he's pointing out, all those relationships that you've been in, uh, in and out of, for, for the vast majority of your life, and that relationship that you're currently stuck in right now, here's what they all serve as. They're not, they're not evidence that your life is going well. They're evidence that you're spiritually thirsty. You're deeply thirsty, but you're drinking from the fountain. I think this is what he's getting at. You're drinking from the fountain of male relationships and approval and sex, and it's dehydrating your soul. It's taking a toll on your quality of life. 
And here's what I think he's saying. Here's what I think Jesus is getting at when he says, go get your husband. He doesn't want to meet her husband. This isn't like a, you know, it was culturally appropriate for Jesus to invite the man to the table. Jesus is getting at something here. I think this is what he's saying. I, I, think, I think he's saying, let's take a hard look. Let's take a hard look at the things and the people you're looking to to satisfy the thirst in your soul. Go get the things you've built your hope around. Go get the things you look to for purpose and peace of mind. Go get your career. Go get your marriage. Go get your finances. Go get your children. Go get your romance. Go get your sexuality. Go get your gender identity. Go get your political ideology. Go get whatever it is, whatever it is that you're filling the bucket of your soul with, go get it. And we're going to do a real quick side-by-side comparison. We're going to put what you're looking to in Jesus right next to each other. And all he wants to show her is that nothing in this world is capable of giving her the, sat- the deep soul satisfaction that Jesus is capable of giving her. What Jesus is getting at is it's pretty simplistic. It's infinite desires can't be met by finite things. None of the wells you draw from can quench the infinite thirst of your soul. And, but, 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 but even more important than that, the reason, the reason that we have this infinite thirst in our souls is because we were made in the likeness and image of an infinite God. And because of this, every time, every single time, like without fail, every time we try to fill the bucket of our souls with anything other than God, here's what we're doing. We're sabotaging our own satisfaction and we're hijacking our own lives. And what's, what's becoming clear in my mind is that you're never going to find the living water Jesus offers you until you find the wells you've been drinking from. But what's so amazing, because that could seem like hard work. It could seem like what I'm suggesting is, well, you've got to do the deep work and discover what you're turning to and all that. But, but, but hear this. This is what I think is so amazing about Jesus, is that if, if you let him, he'll gently, just like he's doing with this woman, he'll gently and patiently leads you to discover the specific ways that you're sabotaging your own souls. And he'll freely give you this soul-satisfying living water. Now, now, now I, do, I do think that um, it's appropriate, it's, it's helpful to, to point out that the idea that Jesus is the only one who's capable of, of satisfying uh, our souls or providing the kind of satisfaction that our souls desire, I think that can be hard to reconcile. And, and, and I think... Frankly, it can cause some people, when you start saying this kind of stuff, it can cause people to become indifferent. And I just want to point out, that's exactly where the Samaritan woman's at. She, at this point in time, is completely indifferent to what Jesus has to say. Look at verse 19. She's still trying to get Jesus off her back. She says, Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, yet you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. She's done getting personal at this point in time. And so she, she, she kind of shifts the narrative. She shifts the conversation. And she just brings up the most polarizing topic that she can think of. And what's so amazing about Jesus is he doesn't choose a side of this theological debate that she's trying to have about the temple or where people are supposed to worship. And I think that's partly because the work that he's doing in her heart isn't done, but it's also because Jesus just doesn't fit neatly into either of those categories. Jesus doesn't fit neatly into either perspective on where people are supposed to worship and what they're supposed to worship. Listen to what he says in verse verse 21. Jesus told her, believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. I th- Jesus, here's, here's what he's saying. He's saying something new is unfolding. Something different is unfolding. Something more powerful and more satisfying than either of the temples you're talking about is coming. The hour is coming. Every time Jesus says this, he said, and he says it a number of times throughout John's gospel account, he says, the hour is coming, or his hour is coming. And every time he says this, it's just Jesus pointing forward to how his death is going to completely revolutionize the universe. It's going to unlock the floodgates of living water and give people access to a quality of life that will free you from playing this dangerous game of believing that you'd be satisfied if you had more or you, with, or you were with someone else or you were further along or you had a different position in society. It's a quality of life. Here's, here's what I think it, it, it is. It's a quality of life that's so rich and robust, it'll make a poor man feel rich and a rich man feel poor at the drop of a hat. 
So, so all that to say, she's still unsure about what Jesus is getting at. And here's what she says. I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. I don't know what she's really trying to say, but it almost is like this roundabout way. Thanks for sharing, Jesus. Uh, when the Messiah comes, he'll bring the clarity that I'm really looking for. But then Jesus says something really astounding, and he just plainly introduces himself. He plainly lets her know who he really is. He says, I'm he, Jesus told her, the one speaking to you. And look, what, what he has been so politely and gently and, and kindly trying to help this woman see is that everyone, everyone is filling the bucket of their soul with someone or something. And, and what, what, he's, what, he's, what he's saying is when you discover what it is that you've given your ultimate allegiance to, when you discover what it is that you've made your highest purpose or your greatest cause, when you discover what it is that's become your deepest desire, all you have to do is transfer all of that to Jesus. I am he means Jesus is the one you can transfer all your desires to, all your hopes to, all your affection to. He's the one you can make your highest purpose. He's the one you can give your deepest affection to. And when you do, living water will spring up inside you like a wellspring for eternal life. And so she finally discovers this. After this statement that Jesus makes, she finally comes to grips with everything that, that he's been trying to, to, to reveal to her and help her discover. And here's what, here's what happens to her. Here's what, here's what happens. Jesus becomes everything to her. And she leaves her water pot behind. And she runs right toward all the people who've ridiculed her and rejected her and abused her. Right toward all the people she's been avoiding all along. All the people who looked down on her. She runs toward them. And she's not hiding anymore. Listen to what she says. She says, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. I, and I don't know about where you're at with your, like, the, the sin in your life or the weaknesses that you have. It never feels good initially when someone points all those things out. This woman is saying, hey, a man just showed me the deepest, darkest, darkest parts of my soul, and I need you to meet him. She's excited about it. You see, what, when she discovered how the well she was drinking from was leaving her spiritually dehydrated, she finally took a drink of water that actually brought her to life. And so what she did is she had transferred all of her affection to Jesus. And living water, this living water of Jesus started to quench the thirst of her soul and the chains of her past were completely broken. And now all she really wants, she just wants people to experience Jesus the way that she has. She wants people to transfer all of their affection, all of their desire, all of their hope to Jesus the same way that she has because she knows that Jesus is the only one capable of quenching the infinite thirst of the human soul. And the reason, the reason nothing else can quench our spiritual thirst is because Jesus is the living water that absolutely every human being needs. He's the living water we were built to run on. And the only reason this Samaritan woman found the living water her soul needed was because Jesus approached her and he was thirsty. It was Jesus' thirst that ultimately led to this wellspring of living water in her soul. You see, when Jesus showed up that day and he said that he was thirsty, this wasn't the last time that he would say, I thirst. You see, when he was on the cross, he cried out, I thirst. And, and, and the reason for that was Jesus, from the cross, endured ultimate thirst so that we could have access to a living water that would ultimately quench our spiritual thirst. Jesus experienced the ultimate, ultimate spiritual thirst so he could give you the water that if you drink it, you'll never thirst again. And living water isn't something that you earn. Power can't obtain it. Money can't buy it. Merit can't procure it. It's a gift, and it's a gift that Jesus is freely offering at an infinite cost to himself. So please, don't, don't make this more difficult than Jesus, than Jesus makes it. Look, if Jesus isn't at the center of your life, all he's inviting you to do, this is all he's inviting you to do, it takes one thing. All he's inviting you to do is have the humility to admit that you're thirsty, that things aren't working out the way that you thought they would, that those things you thought were going to bring deep 
lasting satisfaction really aren't as satisfying as you thought they were going to be. That you need a new wellspring to drink from. That you want to fill the bucket of your soul with the living water of Jesus. That's all you have to do. All you have to do is have the humility to admit that. And then Jesus, just like he did with this Samaritan woman, will give you living water that will start to quench the thirst of your soul. And the, you'll, you'll actually start to live from there forward. And so, so that's, that's one side of it. But, but for, those of you, for those of you who do have Jesus at the center of your lives, and, and maybe you're in a season where it's become really difficult to taste the living water that Jesus provides. And maybe that's because life is breaking you down in ways that you didn't realize it was going to break you down. Maybe it's because things are piling on top of that wellspring of life because of the things that you've done or because of what's happening to you or happening around you. And maybe you're losing sight of the hope and the purpose and the love and the peace that Jesus once made so real to you. If that's where you're at, I want you to remember that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I want you to remember, remember that nothing can stop the water Jesus gave you from becoming a well of water springing up within you for eternal life. I want you to remember that Jesus, Jesus is the full measure of God's promise to satisfy your life with goodness. And so uh, to help us remember that Jesus is the ultimate goodness of God, that can satisfy the deep thirst that's in the human soul. We're going to end our time together by taking communion. And I'm going to invite the, the worship team back up here on the stage um, as we get ready for that. Now, communion, communion is something that Jesus uh, in, instituted for his people. And he did it, he did it uh, just, before, just before he died. So it was like right around 33 A.D., so thousands of years ago. Jesus instituted this, and what I think is really powerful is that for thousands of years, the, the, the heritage of, of, of God's family has, has celebrated communion together, and they've done that for some very specific reasons. And Jesus actually instituted communion to give us a means by which to remember his great sacrifice. Uh, to remember the, the, the perfect work that he accomplished. To remember everything that he had, he had done to, to make a way for us to have a right relationship with God. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to remember some of those things. Now, on your seat, um, when you came in, you, you found the elements. You found some, some bread and you found some juice. And um, before we share that bread and before we, we drink that, that juice together... I just want to remind us of, of something that we talked about today, that, that God is fully capable, that because of Jesus, God is fully capable of satisfying you with goodness, of satisfying your life with goodness. And I want you to consider that there, I think there is something that every last one of us has in common. Uh, that, that to some degree or another, all of us are trying to quench the deep, thirst of our souls with something or someone that really just can't satisfy the thirst of our souls the way that the living water of Jesus can. And I want to encourage you to remember that the living water Jesus offers is capable of giving you a purpose, a love, an acceptance, a peace, and a beauty that no matter what happens, no matter what you face in this life, no matter what burdens get piled on to your life, his joy and his goodness will break through. Just like the water in a spring breaks through the surface of the earth. Jesus is promising a permanent satisfaction that wells up from within you for eternal life. No matter how bad things break down around you. And so... Before we take communion, I'm going to read Psalm 103. And really, the, and, and really the purpose for that is to help us remember these great promises of God that, that should be in our, uh, our life-changing, life-shaping, soul-satisfying. I'm going to read those verses, and the worship team is going to, going to play quietly for a few minutes. And the whole point of that is to give you um, space to get quiet with the living God. And to reflect on how good he's been to you, reflect on his promises, and to deepen your relationship with him. And then once we've done that, we'll take communion together. So here's what Psalm 103 says. 
It says, my soul praise Yahweh and all that is within me. Praise his holy name. My soul praise the Lord and do not forget all his benefits. He forgives all your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Amen. Right, we're going we're gonna to take communion together as a church family. Now, when, when Jesus instituted communion the night he was betrayed, um, he was sharing a meal with his disciples. And he took bread and he shared it with them and he said that, that the bread represented his body that would be broken for all of us. And so as, I, as we take this bread, I want to invite you to remind your own heart that we, we, we worship Jesus, the man who, who was called the bread of life, who came to be broken so that broken people like us could be made whole in him. Let's take the bread together. After that, um, Jesus took the cup, and he said that the cup represented his blood that would be spilled to redeem us. Now, as we take the cup, I want to invite us to remember that salvation has been made freely available to everyone at an infinite cost to Jesus. Salvation is purely available to us because of the broken body and the spilled blood of King Jesus. Let's take the cup together. I'll pray for us and then we'll, we'll finish our time together with, with one final song. God, we are, we're thankful for your promises. We thankful, we're thankful that every single one of your promises has been tested and that Jesus is proof of that. And we're thankful that we, because of, because of Jesus, all of our sin can be forgiven. Because of Jesus, all of our diseases can be healed. Because of Jesus, our lives can be redeemed from the pit. Because of Jesus, we can be crowned with your faithful love and compassion. And because of Jesus, all our lives can be fully satisfied with goodness. God, I pray that we would be the kind of people that, that remember your promises, that drive your promises deep into the recesses of our hearts so that regardless of what's happening around us, regardless of the breakdowns that we face in this life, God, we, we will experience the revolutionary power that you can provide in our lives. That you, God, you're the kind of God that, that um, regardless of what's happening around us, you can use all the brokenness around us to refine us. And we're asking that you would do that, God, and that we would be the kind of people that would allow you to fully work in our lives. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your promises. Help us to be the kind of people that remember your promises. In your holy name, amen.